please welcome Jeffrey Bennington. And the paper you'll be relieved to know is in English, <coughs> but I couldn't resist giving it a French title, which I won't translate. And the title is A la rigueur. I have an epigraph from Richard Rorty, and you'll see why I chose it immediately. Richard Rorty says, Bennington is big on rigor. <laughs> and as Richard Rorty points out in the article from which I take that epigraph, and which I've chosen to read as one of the nicest things anybody's ever said about me, at least in a professional context, many commentators on Derrida's work have appealed to the notion of rigor. This term has been invoked both to deplore its supposed lack, for example, in the infamous letter in which a number of more or less known and unknown philosophers protested against Derrida's being awarded an honorary degree at Cambridge. That letter claimed that his work, quote, does not meet accepted standards of clarity and rigor. But it's also been invoked to claim that rigor really is a feature of that work, something to be valued in it, a quality that means it cannot accurately be described in the anything-goes or free-play terms that often characterized its early reception. Rorty himself, of course, is not so big on rigor. And indeed, I chide him for just that failing in the book he's reviewing in his article. And he fears that characterizing Derrida's work in such terms will commit one to the view that that work is in the end rather dispiritingly traditional unfortunately philosophical, and more especially philosophical in an essentially Kantian kind of way. My point's not to criticize Rorty's understanding of Derrida in general, but to take quite seriously what's at stake in this language of rigor as it comes to be used in and around Derrida's work, and more especially to use it as a way into considering once again what for me is the still quite mysterious relation of deconstruction to critique in the Kantian sense. As the success of the term quasi-transcendental in describing some important features of Derrida's thinking might suggest, this relation to critique in the Kantian sense, critique and not doctrine, critique held short of its doctrinal telos, as it were, this relation to critique seems quite important in understanding Derridian deconstruction in general, and in understanding its own understanding of its relation to the philosophical tradition. So if I can summarize a little brutally, as Derrida might have said, if the tradition of the metaphysics of presence comes in his later work to seem especially perspicuous, most saliently or most egregiously itself, as it were, around the theologico-political logic of sovereignty, and if the issue of the death penalty comes to be seen as something of a crux or keystone of that logic, as he indeed suggests in seminars conducted between 1998 and 2000, and in the associated interview in the book De Quoi Demain, I think it's translated as For What Tomorrow, Of What Tomorrow, perhaps, then we should perhaps not be unduly surprised to find him undue, uh, explicitly crediting Kant rather than some other philosopher with formulating what he, Derrida, calls the most rigorous defense of the death penalty and thus by extension of the logic of sovereignty itself. And therefore the defense that most calls for deconstructive attention if the challenge of those seminars is to be fulfilled. And that challenge is explicitly to formulate for the first time in Derrida's hypothesis an abolitionist discourse able to compete on the same philosophical level, as it were, with Kant's rationalist argument in favor of the death penalty or at least to be in a position to call into question the conceptual bases of Kant's arguments in this respect. We can claim with some confidence that this is the specific philosophical challenge of the death penalty seminars, though as we should also try not to forget, these seminars and indeed deconstruction more generally can never just be philosophical, never simply philosophical or philosophical through and through, unless perhaps we take that expression through and through more in the sense it has in forensic ballistics and suggest that deconstruction involves going right through philosophy and emerging more or less explosively 
on the other side. That philosophical challenge can't avoid some more or less rigorous engagement with rigor itself, with the very concept of rigor in general, as it is apparently best exemplified by Kant. Kant is the only author mentioned in every single session of both years of the death penalty seminars and is the explicit object of far more analysis than any other philosopher. In this particular case, there'll be an association to be explored between rigor in the sense of accuracy and precision on the one hand, and on the other, rigor in the sense of harshness and hardness, stiffness and rigidity, exemplarily perhaps as rigor mortis. And here's just a little quote from a much longer extract from an early session of the seminars. Derrida says, the effect of coldness, of frozen insensitivity that often takes hold of us when faced with the discourse, the process of judgment, or with the ritual of execution of the death penalty, this effect of cadaverous coldness or rigor as rigor mortis is also, or first of all, the manifestation of the power or claim to the power of reason. It's the allegation of an imperturbable rationality rising above the heart, above immediate passion, and above the individual relations between men of flesh and blood. It is this alliance between reason, universal rationality, and the machine, the machinality of its operation. Now, although Derrida is here only beginning to map out the terms of the debate as it's traditionally been conducted, the link is clear between rigor in the rationalist sense that will be best exemplified by Kant, and rigor in the sense of hardness, rigidity, and by extension harshness in the execution of the law, then quite readily figured by the cadaverous rigidity of the executed corpse. As we shall see, the internal tensions this raises for the rationalist position are themselves already at work in Kant, whose very rigour, or so I'll be suggesting, allows a deconstructive event to happen. And this seems to be a general rule with deconstruction, although I think it's sometimes still presented as seeking out and exacerbating marginal or inessential weaknesses or inconsistencies in the texts it reads. It seems, in fact, most to thrive in showing up failings or aporias that result from the very rigour of those texts when they are at their strongest and best, rather than from contingent lapses or oversights, however symptomatic such lapses or oversights may also be taken to be. And this would be one reason why deconstruction has had repeatedly to measure itself against critique in the Kantian sense. You may remember of, of all the things that Derrida says deconstruction is not, and there are very many, the thing that it especially is not is Kantian critique. The thing that it most is not is Kantian critique. So that we might, we might want to say that Derrida is very close to Kant, right up against Kant, tout contre Kant. Kant then, and more especially the first part of Kant's Metaphysics of Morals, the Rechtlehre, or Doctrine of Right, will represent for Derrida the most rigorous philosophical attempt to justify the death penalty on rational grounds. And if in Derrida's repeated hypothesis, which he also firmly expresses in conversation with Elizabeth Rudinesco in Of What Tomorrow, if no philosopher as such has ever opposed the death penalty, and to that extent philosophy has always been at least implicitly supportive of it, then Kant's explicit rational endorsement of it can be taken to stand for the philosophical position on the matter, the position that would have to be refuted or deconstructed if a properly philosophical opposition to the death penalty were to be attempted. Now Kant's justification of the death penalty more especially hangs, if I can say that in this context, <laughs> on his general grounding of all penal law in a principle that functions as what he explicitly presents as its categorical imperative. And this principle is quite simply that of the so-called talionic law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, as it's often perhaps misleadingly formulated. Kant's object, which might indeed be called all sublime, like that of Gilbert's Mikado, in that it supposedly bespeaks an incomparable rational dignity of the human beyond the concerns and interests of mere phenomenal or animal life, 
is simply to make the punishment fit the crime. Although Kant's formulation transforms any vengeance-based understanding of the Talionic law into a reflexive and purely formal structure whereby the principle of retaliation in question is justified by the view that any crime is to be understood as simultaneously perpetrated, as it were, on the perpetrator, him or herself. So in the Doctrine of Right, Kant writes this, quote, But what kind and what amount of punishment is it that public justice makes its principle and measure? None other than the principle of equality in the position of the needle on the scale of justice to incline no more to one side than to the other. Accordingly, whatever undeserved evil you inflict upon another within the people, that you inflict upon yourself. If you insult him, you insult yourself. If you steal from him, you steal from yourself. If you strike him, you strike yourself. If you kill him, you kill yourself. But only the law of retribution and Kant then gives in Latin, jus talionis, it being understood, of course, that this is applied by a court and not by your private judgment, only the jus talionis can specify definitively the quality and the quantity of punishment. All other principles are fluctuating and unsuited for a sentence of pure and strict justice. A strict justice, the, the German adjective is streng, which could, of course, also be translated as rigorous. So a sentence of pure and rigorous justice because extraneous considerations are mixed into them. And then just a little later, glossing the, the what's at stake in this perhaps slightly strange claim, Kant says, but what does it mean to say, if you steal from someone, you steal from yourself? Whoever steals makes the property of everyone else insecure and therefore deprives himself by the principle of retribution of security in any possible property. He has nothing and can also acquire nothing, but he still wants to live, and this is now possible only if others provide for him. But since the state will not provide for him free of charge, he must let it have his powers for any kind of work it pleases in convict or prison labor and is reduced to the status of a slave for a certain time or permanently if the state sees fit. It's interesting enough, I won't be commenting on that part of the passage at all. If, however, he has committed murder, he must die. There is no, here there is no substitute that will satisfy justice. There's a limit case of substitution where it's not even a substitution. Here there is no substitute that will satisfy justice. There is no similarity between life, however wretched it may be, and death. Hence no likeness between the crime and the retribution unless death is judicially carried out upon the wrongdoer. End of quote. Derrida spends a lot of time repeatedly probing this principle as Kant formulates it, and he finds it to be surprisingly resistant to criticism from, for example, um, psychoanalytic, a psychoanalytic perspective. Derrida seems genuinely impressed by Kant's formal rigor and is especially attached, as he is elsewhere in his work, to Kant's difficult formulations around the concept of dignity, würde, as something that exceeds all comparative assessment, all calculation, and price. In Kant, that dignity is reserved for humans in their humanity as essentially rational. And part of the stamp of that rationality is its intrinsic superiority over merely phenomenal or animal life. And so the supposedly rational ending of that life by the imposition of the death penalty purely in the name of the formal categorical imperative of Talionic law then becomes, in a sense, the best confirmation of human dignity. So long, that is, and here Kant would probably begin to part ways with Gilbert's Mikado, who you may remember wanted not only the punishment to fit the crime but also to be a source of innocent merriment, as he puts it, um, so long, that is, as the humanity in the person of the condemned is not disrespected by being made into, as Kant puts it, something abominable in the way the punishment is carried out. And this, of course, is the principle whereby the death penalty in the U.S. is very widely thought to be justifiable, including by the Supreme Court, so long as it's not cruel and unusual in its execution. The death penalty 
becomes then the best confirmation of human dignity so long as the humanity in the person of the condemned is not disrespected and so long as the properly rational justification for it, which is purely formal, whence its beauty and its rigor, is not confused or contaminated with reference to any kind of utilitarian end whatsoever. Kant is resolutely opposed to any attempt to justify the death penalty in terms of its supposedly exemplary deterrent effect on crime, for example, and so his argument is entirely impervious to abolitionist arguments that are based on the claim that it does not, in fact, have such a deterrent effect. He says, for example, in a passage that Derrida also quotes, and that Derrida describes as a little crazy, un peu dingue, he says, uh, that even if a state were to agree to disband and dissolve itself so that no question of future deterrence could arise, it would still be morally incumbent upon its members to make sure to execute all remaining condemned prisoners before they disbanded and dissolved, or else they would remain tainted by the blood guilt, as Kant calls it, that would ensue from unpunished crime, thus making them what he calls collaborators in a public violation of justice. I want to spend a little time looking at the notion of what we saw Kant call pure and strict or rigorous justice supposedly ensured by the principle of the Talionic law and that leads to his defence of the death penalty. If Derrida is correct in his general construal of the relation of the death penalty to the metaphysical or theologico-political tradition more generally, the standing of this purity and rigour would be a deconstructive crux of these seminars and by extension perhaps of the entire later arc of Derrida's thinking, especially given the salient place of an appeal to justice in that thinking, if not indeed of his thinking from the start. If Kant's definition of pure and strict or rigorous justice were to give rise to something other than justice, for example, then it would appear that some not insignificant progress might have been made in the deconstruction of the death penalty and thereby of sovereignty and perhaps thereby also of the very concept of rigor itself. And indeed, this notion of pure and strict justice generates a number of paradoxes that seem to me to illuminate Derrida's general way of thinking here. Although for the next part of the paper, I'm going to take my bearings from an appendix to the introduction of Kant's text, the Doctrine of Right, that Derrida does not in fact ever explicitly discuss in the death penalty seminars, and that is taking a rather more general view of right and justice than the passages that deal explicitly with punishment and exemplarily the death penalty. This appendix is something Derrida refers to once in earlier work without any supporting analysis, but says, suggests, and I'm quoting, what is played out in these pages is quite simply vertiginous. So in the introduction to the Rechtlehrer, Kant first separates out the domain of right, what he's calling right, from the domain of virtue, which is the object, as you know, of the other half of the um, metaphysics of morals. The former, the domain of right, considers the limitation of my freedom by that of others, not as a question of moral duty, but of justifiable constraint. Law or right is law or right only if it can be enforced, such that Kant can say here that, and I'm quoting, right and authorization to use coercion mean one and the same thing. End of quote. And this essential element of force or constraint allows right to be formulated, quoting again, by analogy with the possibility of free movement of bodies within the law of the equality of action and reaction, end of quote. So having separated right out from virtue, with right at least already somewhat more, if only by analogy on the side of the physical, the external and the mechanical, law of equality of action and reaction, Kant nonetheless recognises a kind of frontier zone on no man's land, which, although it does not fall into the domain of virtue, also does not simply belong to the domain of right, while still always tending to appeal to that domain for decision. And this curious frontier zone is presented through the discussion of what Kant calls two cases that appear to be diametrically opposed and which limit or delimit the domain of right a little as contradiction and tautology are the limiting cases 
of the combination of signs in logical space according to Wittgenstein's Tractatus. And as is often the case in Kant when trouble is brewing, these cases are presented with reference to Epicurus. Quote, but without making incursions into the province of ethics, one finds two cases that lay claim to a decision about rights, although no one can be found to decide them. So two cases that lay claim to a decision about rights, though no one can be found to decide them, and that belong, as it were, within the intermundia of Epicurus. We must first separate these two cases from the doctrine of right proper, to which we are about to receive, so that their wavering principles, same idiom can't use to criticise any other justification for penal law than the talionic principle, so that their wavering principles will not affect the firm basic principles of the doctrine of right. And this interworldly, intermundian, intermundial space is from the point of view of right at any rate a place of uncertainty, ambiguity or equivocation. Kant calls it a jus equivocum and is placed in an appendix to the introduction, as I said. The two cases in question here are quite general and run the risk, if one's not careful, of invading the whole space of right if they're not excluded from it, which is exactly what Kant is trying to do in this opening appendix. One case is what Kant calls simply equity, and the other what he calls the right of necessity. So, equitas and ius necessitatis. The appeal to equity tends to pull right back towards ethics, and the right of necessity tends to pull it in the other direction towards mere mechanism, by analogy with which Kant, in any case, always has to think right just because right is not right unless it can be enforced, as we saw. The whole domain of right, as Kant defines it, is situated between these two supposedly marginal, equivocal, and slightly shady kinds of supposed right. Here's Kant again, quote, An authorization to use coercion is connected with any right in the narrow sense, your strictum, but people also think of a right in a wider sense. This is what Kant in his rigor is going to contest, ius latium, in which there is no law by which an authorization to use coercion can be determined. There are two such true or alleged rights, equity and the right of necessity. The first admits a right without coercion. The second, coercion without right. can easily be seen that this ambiguity really arises from the fact that they, these are cases in which a right is in question for which no judge can be appointed to render a decision. End of quote. I tend to want to say that that means that there's a right in question here which is not a sovereign right or an exception that's not subject to a principle of sovereignty unless we followed sovereignty in a more Bataillon than Kantian direction. The argument from equity arises when the strict, rigorous application of right produces injustice, as judged according to a criterion that cannot, however, be presented to any tribunal and which cannot, therefore, give rise to a properly legal judgment. Kant gives a terribly pedestrian example where, according to equity, one ought not to respect the principle of equal distribution of proceeds and losses in a case where one business partner has done more work than others and therefore suffered proportionately greater losses when the business went under. According to the law, one must respect the contract that demands <coughs> equality of distribution. Equity, says Kant, is a mute divinity who cannot be heard, but one that nevertheless incites people to present cases before a tribunal when those cases can, according to Kant, in fact be heard only by the court of conscience. Kant doesn't contest the truth of what he calls equity's motto, which is simply summum ius summa injuria. The strictest right is the greatest wrong. This Latin tag has a long and complex history back into ancient Greek um, originally apparently from a play by Menander, um, and there, there, thereafter it's picked up by all sorts of people. There's a whole history there which I'll um, spare you. But the, the motto, summum ius summa injuria, seems to be full of deconstructive promise. And we could imagine experimenting with various more or less free translations of it. Maybe not just extreme right is extreme wrong, or 
the height of law is the height of lawlessness, but maybe also the height is the depths, the top is the bottom, the best is the worst, the sovereign is a beast, or even remembering that lovely Latin term for sovereignty, super anus, the sovereign is an asshole. <laughs> Which would rapidly lead us back to Bataille, of course, and the solar anus. So Kant does not at all contest the truth of that motto, but simply the ability of right to remedy that wrong, which it seems to produce in and through its very righteousness, or if you will, through its very rigor. The second equivocal case is the law of necessity, the supposed law of necessity, jus necessitatis, or not, not recht. Kant deals with it even more rapidly under the sign of contradiction because here there would supposedly be a right where in fact there's no prior injustice. I invoke the right of necessity not when the other has attacked me and I have killed him to save my own life in self-defense, but when without its being at all his fault, I would die if I did not kill him. After the shipwreck, I push the only other survivor off the single piece of floating wreckage in order to use it to save myself and see him fall into the depths and drown or else we make it to the desert island and then I kill and eat him to avoid starvation. Here I'm acting under a certain constraint, naught, but right cannot be involved, says Kant, because there could be no penal law to punish this case. He says it would make no sense to threaten me with death for taking by force the last floating plank, since the threat of an ill which is still uncertain, death by a judicial verdict, cannot outweigh the fear of an ill that is certain, in this case, drowning. This does not mean that the action is just or justified exactly. I've caused someone to die without um, justification. Nor even that it's exactly legal. It's not quite that I'm, guilt that I'm not guilty. It's simply that I'm not punishable. Invoking the supposed law of necessity changes nothing with respect to my guilt because Kant says there could be no necessity that would make what is wrong conform with law. So in both cases, we're faced with what Kant calls equivocation. In the case of equity, subjective right is exercised by reason, justifies me in my claim, whereas objective right as practiced by the tribunal can only find that I'm in the wrong. I won't get more money than the other people when the business fails. In the case of necessity, subjective right says I'm wrong because I killed somebody, where the objective right of the tribunal finds that it cannot punish me. In both cases, the strict or proper exercise of right leaves at least a residue or soupçon of injustice which belongs to the intermundus or the frontier of right in the sense that it nonetheless concerns right. The case of equity is not purely an ethical or moral matter and the cases of supposed necessity are always questionable as to the true measure of that necessity. In both cases, the question is that of a possible legal judgment by a tribunal. Now, in order to put forth a doctrine of right, which is what he's supposed to be doing in this text, in the Metaphysics of Morals, Kant has to dismiss the problem of equity, even though it can clearly show up at any moment in the exercise of right, and even though it must, in fact, I think, show up in every case. Each time right is rendered in pure and rigorous legality, to the exact extent that the more right is right, the less just it is. Perfectly right, right, analogically mathematical or mechanical right, right in all its rectitude and rigor, always runs the risk, just because of that rigor, its purity and strictness, of being not so much purely right as merely right. Constraint without justice, force of law becomes simple force, and thus absolutely unjust. It would seem as though the appeal to equity, as Kant defines it here, is registering a tension between right and justice that such an important feature of Derrida's seminal essay, Force of Law, and much of what follows in his thinking. And even though the case of the appeal to the law of necessity seems as though it would show up less often on the basis of Kant's example, it's no less important in that the very possibility of such an unjudgeable case, even if there were only one, seems to put the very possibility of a clearly delimited doctrine of right into question. And in fact, it's probably no accident that this problem of a supposed right of necessity returns explicitly in Kant at a crucial point of his political philosophy, 
namely that of revolution, discussed at some length by Derrida in the seminars. It's hard not to see some similarity or analogy between the shipwreck survivor who's guilty but unpunishable and what happens in political revolution. Here the revolutionaries are, according to the logic of sovereignty that Kant lays out implacably, rigorously, if you like, they're never within their rights, even though they may be attempted to appeal to the supposed right of necessity to justify their actions. For according to Kant, it would be simply a contradiction to concede a right to revolution, which would amount to recognizing a sovereignty other than that of the sovereign, which is simply contradictory. And the revolutionaries are therefore punishable by death, however great the distress or the necessity, the naught that they claim to have been in under the sovereign against whom they're revolting. But once the revolution has succeeded, if it does succeed, they're clearly unpunishable too. Right cannot punish this action that suspends and interrupts right, and yet right is also suspended on it. In the case of revolution, this case shows how right in fact originates in a violence that escapes its own judgment, the kind of foundational or transcendental violence that Derrida discusses in Force of Law and pursues in these seminars in the tension in Kant between his absolutely horrified condemnation of the supposedly legal execution of Charles I and Louis XVI. Kant refers to it as an abyss swallowing everything without recall in a famous footnote to the Metaphysics of Morals. The tension between that on the one hand and on the other his apparently more positive account in the conflict of the faculties of the enthusiasm with which the revolution was received by observers as, or spectators as a sign that the human race is progressing for the better. The danger of revealing such foundational violence also seems to be what dictates Kant's firm assertion elsewhere in the Rechtslehrer that subjects should not inquire into the factual historical origin of the state in which they live, lest their almost inevitable discovery of its violent origin inspire them to resistance against the current sovereign, which resistance could entirely legitimately be um, punished, got rid of, or expelled, as Kant says. So equity appears singularly in every case as a kind of inevitable bending back of the right that always tends to be too right, in the sense of too straight, rectus, too strict and righteous, rigorous. And the law, on the other hand, of, or the case of necessity, which is always an exceptional case, at the basis of right. In fact, as Kant often, ex often insists, law in general, the very concept of law in all its rigor, must have the character of necessity, be it on the side of the laws of nature dictated by the legislative understanding or on the side of the moral law, where the typic that supposedly borrows from the law of nature the form of lawfulness also borrows from it precisely this character of necessity. And the problem of Kant's thinking about law seems to be concentrated in this issue, this equivocation of a necessity that both grounds law and right and then here immediately undermines its foundations. It's necessary that the law have the character of necessity, but necessity knows no law and is the suspension of all justice. Furthermore, on this reading, necessity as a character of the law is exactly what equity is mutely contesting from the other end of legal space, exactly what places the rigor and righteousness of right in tension with an appeal to justice. It's always tendentially denying and against which the appeal to equity is the perpetual protest. I'd like to suggest that the logic, at least, of these two exceptionally equivocal cases show up in the question of the death penalty, which would then indeed become the case where the very rigor of Kant's thinking in general, of the jus talionis as the categorical imperative of penal law, is most in evidence and so potentially also most in crisis. And this seems to have something to do with a very general deconstructive way of thinking, whereby the more something appears to become itself or to come into its own, the more just justice appears to become by conforming more and more to the purely formal talionic principle, the more right or straight right gets. And so the more nearly it seems to approach its apparent talos, the more it tends, catastrophically, I often tend to find myself saying, 
to collapse into the parent opposite of itself. Here, exactly as the motto of equity says, summum jus summa in uria, so that the death penalty is both the very keystone of the rational system of penal law, the guarantor of its dignity, what raises man above mere phenomenal life, and something like its ongoing scandal or inner principle of collapse and ruin. And I'm assuming that this structure is at least formally similar to what the later Derrida often describes, though not here, in terms of autoimmunity. I think Derrida is getting at something like this when he refers in session five of the first year of the seminar, where he's talking about two cases of homicide that Kant awkwardly wants to exempt from the death penalty while waiting for culture to catch up with rationality. Those two cases being maternal infanticide on the one hand and death resulting from dueling in the military on the other. Derrida refers to, and I'm quoting, the extraordinary rationality but also the stupid uselessness of this Kantian logic. This Kantian position, I'm quoting again, that is as rigorous as it is absurd. Aussi rigoureuse qu'absurde. And we might try to sum up that simultaneous rigor and absurdity as consisting in Kant's stubborn reliance on a whole set of distinctions. It would take much longer to demonstrate this in any detail. But between, for example, nature and civil society, the subjective and the objective, the phenomenal and the noumenal, and saliently here, reliance on a distinction between what Kant calls in Latin poina naturalis and poina forensis, between the inner punishment of conscience and the outer punishment of the penal system, between auto-punishment and hetero-punishment, if you like, a distinction that's quite fundamental for Kant, but one that Derrida claims has no rigour once the reflexive structure of the talionic principle, whereby, as you remember, any crime I commit, I commit against myself, and therefore, in a sense, punish myself already in the execution of the crime. <coughs> once that reflexive structure really is made into the categorical imperative of penal law, and this failure of rigor through rigor itself, in other words, the rigor of the talionic principle leads to the collapse of the supposedly rigorous distinction Kant needs to make between inner and outer, auto and hetero punishment, functions as what Derrida calls in this same session both a hyper-confirmation, that's his word, of Kant's rigor, and then again a real self-exploding bomb, an implosive power at deconstruct of deconstruction at the very centre of the rationality of right, the right of punishment, and at the centre or the summit of the right of punishment, the death penalty. End of quote. I'm almost done. What's stupid and useless about such distinctions, their rigorous absurdity, seems to be that they prescribe for themselves the telos of their own disappearance. And just this seems to be, just this seems to be more generally the principle of difference of Derrida's différence from the idea in the Kantian sense with which it has so often been confused, especially perhaps in discussions of Derrida's later, more obviously, ethical and political work, a confusion that has happened a great deal in spite of Derrida's very many explicit suggestions that a Kantian idea is most especially what it is not. If humans were indeed rational, they would not break the law and the death penalty, as exemplary of the Talionic principle and thus of rationality itself, would never have to be applied and would thus no longer stand as an exemplary instance of that same rationality, but rather as a potential proof of its failure. We're rational to the extent that we have the death penalty, and we're not yet rational to the extent that we need to have the death penalty. If we ever were fully and rigorously rational, if the law were never broken, then there would be no case, and human action would have become every bit as mechanical, necessary if you like, as the phenomenal nature from which humanity in its noumenal aspect is apparently so strenuously to be distinguished, exemplarily here by the death penalty as the stamp of the superior rational calling of humanity. Achieved justice as rationality would not even be justice, but the very necessity from which it needs, in spite of itself, to distinguish itself. In other words, if the penal law really were necessary, 
it would be quite unnecessary. So just as at the end of the book recently retranslated as Voice and Phenomenon, all of Husserl's essential distinctions are shown to depend for their coherence on the very failure of reason to achieve its teleological end in the convergence of fact and right, so that the teleology is interrupted and famously in an obscure slogan that, as some of you know, I think is the key to all Derridology. I have a T-shirt to prove it, but I forgot to bring it with me. And that slogan is, Infinite difference is finite. It looks terrific on a T-shirt. <laughs> so just as at the end of Voice and Phenomenon, infinite difference is finite, so Kant's right depends on the very obliqueness, curvature, or equivocation to which it's also rationally committed to putting an end. And this structure would also, or so my hypothesis goes, describe everything that it's tempting to present as an idea in the Kantian sense, and would be exactly what's at stake in the, what Derrida calls the unconditionals, that his late work is trying to think in a logic other than that of sovereignty, and so other than that of the theologico-political. So we might want to say, along the same lines as the infinite defense is finite slogan, for example, infinite reason is irrational. Or perhaps to use one of my own idioms, the end of reason is the end of reason. And that would then allow us some access to Derrida's gloss in the seminars on a psychoanalytic reading of Kant, where he says, wanting to maintain, even if it is in fact useless and inapplicable, the pure necessity of the death penalty is just talionis and as pure reason, is right up against, as Reich and Freud might say, the paranoid symptom. The principle of Derrida's early response to Husserl, stressing a paradoxical finitude of the infinite, a différence infinie et fini, seems to me to run throughout his work up to these late seminars and beyond to rogues, for example, and to motivate Derrida's own opposition to the death penalty in the name of just such a complex infinite finitude or finite infinitude. What he calls the madness of the death penalty is that it represents an attempt to put an end to to finish off the finitude that is the very opening to the unforeseeable future event that constitutes life itself as thus intrinsically finite and mortal. This complex thought of finitude, which just is what all of Derrida's thinking since Différence and the Trace is trying to elaborate, rather than the existing forms of abolitionist discourse of which Derrida is quite critical in the seminars, would then give a chance for the first philosophical opposition to the death penalty, able to measure up to the rigor of Kant's argumentation, or able to show how that rigor is, when read strictly and rigorously, itself deconstructive of the very oppositions it's supposed to secure. Thank you.